Sam Harris Waking Up Podcast number 67 was the second time Jordan Peterson was a guest. In the first podcast, the two-hour-long conversation remained with a lack of agreement on how to define truth correctly. Harris generally took a truth-as-fact approach, while Peterson defended a pragmatic notion of truth where it was viewed through the lens of Darwinian evolution. This version of truth claimed generally that facts may be trivially true, but actual truth was only true if it contributed to a benefit for the continuation of the species. The second conversation included talking through their ideas about religious beliefs and origins. I have condensed and edited the conversation to highlight some of what they talked about without having to listen to the full two-hour conversation. Although this is edited, I have tried to make sure that nothing is taken entirely out of context. Having said that, the conversation does not flow as I have posted it, and a lot more elaboration is given in the full podcast. If any of this is interesting to anybody, I strongly suggest visiting both Sam or Jordan's channel and listening to the full conversation when you have the time available. A few quick disclaimers here. I have linked to the podcast in the description and will post the link to Sam Harris when he posts it on YouTube. I have not monetized any videos of mine and gained no ad revenue or revenue of any type from posting on YouTube. This may change at some point in the future, but for now, I simply want to offer some insight into people having conversations or expressing ideas that I find useful. I think it connects nicely to the way you were describing kind of our primal circumstance of being an individual or a tribe standing in the face of mute and often hostile nature and trying to figure out what's going on and, and how to live within it. I think that really is the primal circumstance. This is why I think of religion, as you know, as a kind of failed science, as a kind of first attempt to tell a story about what's going on that gives us some power over it. But it's a bad attempt because we didn't develop any kind of methodology at that point to differentiate fact from fiction. Take the case that every parent will be familiar with of standing helplessly over your sick child wondering what's wrong. Let's say your child throws up and has a fever, and you don't know what's wrong with him or her. And this is obviously one of the more, the more ancient moments for any person. And there's a, you know, obvious evolutionary reasons why we would be concerned about this. And so this is quite Darwinian to care what's happening to your, your infant. But today, this primitive uncertainty and helplessness and fear is bracketed by a, a basic understanding of the processes in the world that can affect a human body. And there's obviously enough to worry about there to drive almost any parent crazy. But one thing that is no longer on the menu is the evil eye. When your child gets sick, no part of your mind, if you're sane, is now devoted to the question of whether or not you should go burn your neighbor as a witch because she might have cast a malicious glance at your child, right? But as you know, that was not always so. And in fact, in Africa, people are still murdering their neighbors for the crime of witchcraft. So the problem, from my point of view, is twofold. One is that we know that there's a path forward to rule out things like witchcraft and the evil eye. And that this path is science and rationality generally. But the other problem is that you could still play this game by resort to ancient stories and finding some connection between those stories and evolution. You could play a game of dignifying a belief in magic, in this case, you know, the evil eye specifically, along Jungian lines or archetypal lines or something. You could be sympathetic with this picture, but my point is, what would be the point of that? I mean, given the obvious harms that we no longer need commit based on disavowing this ancient ignorance, why would one spend any time at all trying to make sense of an admittedly ancient concern about sympathetic magic, right? Sympathetic magic is dangerous bullshit. That's basically all I think we need to know about it now. And yet you could spend a lifetime, you could be reading not only Jung, but, you know, sketchier people like Aleister Crowley and Eliphas Levy and all the, you know, the history of Hermeticism. And you could open, you know, Manly Palmer Hall's The Secret Teachings of All Ages and, and just get deep into that stuff. The tradition of Western magic, right? Seems to me to be almost by definition a colossal waste of time and actually unnecessary to preserve anything that we care about at this moment in history. 
I would say that that the there are there's great purpose in looking at these ancient stories in the same way, Sam, as there's great purpose and utility in reading fiction. Here's a sentence for you, and perhaps you can tell me what you make of it. There is great truth revealed in Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and Shakespeare. Do you agree with that or disagree? Because there's no fact in any of that, and there's certainly no scientific data. There's more truth in Dostoevsky's fiction than there is in a single person's life. I don't know if I would go quite that far, but yes, I will totally agree with you that there's a lot of truth in fiction. I don't think that's at all why we got bogged down in our previous discussion about truth. How would you characterize that truth, though? Because it's certainly not factual by, by any stretch of the imagination. It's, it's a different sort of truth. Let me stretch our ma imaginations there. I, I think there's a wide variety of, of facts that are, at the very least, illustrated in fiction. The reason why fiction is compelling to us is that it does map on credibly to our experience of the world or what we can imagine to be valid human experiences. Yeah, precisely. If it were radically strange, which is to say if it all seemed preposterous, that's the definition of an unsuccessful work of fiction. Imagine that I took Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and Shakespeare for, for and they'll do for the time being, and I distilled out what made them great fiction, and I extracted a work of metafiction from them. That would be archetypally religious. You can do this with anything, and religions have been doing this for millennia with specific books, which even by the merits of fiction, for the most part, I and mean, there's some exceptions here, I'll grant you that there's some bits of the Bible that stand comparison with the rest of world literature, but much of it doesn't, right? Most of these books are profoundly mediocre. The Quran is as mediocre a book as I've ever seen on any subject. I'll grant that maybe the Arabic is beautiful. I don't read Arabic, but the content of the book isn't. And this is true of most religious writing. And the, the fact that most people, most of the time, have found profound meaning in much of this work is not proof otherwise. I mean, again, if you found me a culture that was doing what I just did to a recipe in a cookbook, the fact that they had gone generation after generation enamored of that interpretation wouldn't prove anything. That's the problem I'm having here. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, what you wrote is very funny, too. And, and you know, it's very much reminiscent of New Age thinking, I would say. What's the problem with New Age thinking, then, in your view? Well, I don't think it's constrained in exactly in the manner that you said. I mean, I, I mentioned that what I've been trying to do while working my way through the murk, let's say. Look, if you're analyzing scientific literature, you have to separate the wheat from the chaff. And like 95% of it is chaff, unless it's social psychology, in which case 99% of it is chaff. But it's chaff. There's a lot of it. You have to be discriminating in your interpretation in the scientific literature, just as in other and in, in other literary domains. And it's certainly the case that we aren't as good at distinguishing what constitutes quality in the fictional domain from what constitutes outright falsehood and, and delusion, let's say. Um, and it, I use the example of paranoid schizophrenia very specifically there, because paranoids who tend to be among the more intelligent people who are cursed with schizophrenia take a set of axioms and then weave a compelling story that's logically coherent if you grant the validity of the axioms. And so the kind of murk that you're describing, and, and I think that, that characterizes in particular New Age thinking, is, is an ever-present danger, not so much of religious thinking, though, Sam, it's, a, it's an ever-present danger of human imaginativeness. Mm. You know, we can produce representations of the world that grip onto the world in many ways, but then we have to subject them to intense criticism. And that's why, for example, we both share a belief that the last thing we want to do in our society is put any restrictions whatsoever on the human uh, right to criticize religious presuppositions. I think that's an absolute catastrophe. So, so what I've been trying to do is discriminate my way through the, the wealth of past wisdom that has been bequeathed to us and to find patterns and then to ver verify them using other techniques. In my opinion, when you tell people that they should 
abandoned, let's say, their impulsive desires and their instrumental longings and do nothing but tell the truth. In some sense, from my perspective, what you're telling them is to give up their selfish individual being and sacrifice themselves to the truth. To me, that, like, I truly believe that that's the central message of Christianity. It's the central message of the prophetic tradition in Judaism as well, because the people who spoke truth to power in the Old Testament were ha, generally very unpopular for doing so. So I know it's a problem separating the wheat from the chaff. And I think you did a great job of satirizing that in, in what you wrote, but that doesn't help us solve the problem of the fact that there is value in great fiction. I don't view that as a problem. I think it's obvious that there's there's value in it, but it's not the value of telling you how the cosmos works or what is likely to happen in the future, right? It's a different kind of value. It's not a surrogate for a scientific theory about anything. Right. Absolutely. That's what religion does with it. Well, although, well that I would say that Fine, I've got no disagreement with you there. The thing about the fundamentalists, say, the Christian fundamentalists who insist upon a literal understanding of the biblical stories is that they don't know what literal means. And actually, they're, they're better scientists in some sense than the scientists themselves, because the scientists would never say that the stories in Genesis are scientific, but the fundamentalists implicitly assuming that only scientific fact can be true attempt constantly to force these stories into a scientific framework where they do not belong. Right. But again, the because the stories are believed to be, we're talking specifically about the, the Judeo-Christian tradition, because they're believed to be revealed truth, right? I mean, these are not stories written by human beings. These are the word of God in some form. These are not held to be stories. These are held to be records of things that have actually happened. So they're history books on one level. And when they talk about what will happen, when they're obviously given to prophecy, they are an indication of what will happen if you believe God is talking to you. And, and, and that's where the whole thing becomes so pathological from an intellectual point of view. I agree with you. This is partly why I've spent so much time studying Nietzsche. I mean, in the, in the late 1900s, Nietzsche basically diagnosed Christianity. He said that it had produced a tremendous longing for the truth, which was then used against the dogmatic elements of Christianity, which it destroyed. Mm -hmm. But some of it's, I would say, some of it is, is intense philosophical confusion. It's like there's a kind of, let's call it wisdom in fiction, if we don't want to call it truth, because, you know, obviously calling it truth brings up the, the fact issue, let's call it wisdom. The wisdom is clearly there, but to consider it as a representation of the factual world is not only a mistake, but also a dangerous mistake. And it, it's a self-defeating mistake. You know, it's, it's partly why the fundamentalists who insist upon the equivalence of the stories in Genesis and scientific theory do their own creed a tremendous disservice. And they're they're bound to lose because the Bible as science is weak, and science as science is strong. And so there's no, there's no hope there for people who are trying to push fundamentalist Christian stories as literally true. So we can agree on that. If Christianity is right in any sense, well, then all other religions are wrong. When you look at what Christianity entails, so at a minimum, it suggests that Jesus was the Messiah, right? So the Jews are wrong. Jesus was divine and resurrected, so the Muslims are wrong. There's only one God, so the Hindus are wrong, right? So even if you want to relax the literalism there, you're still sending some fairly sharp elbows toward the other religions. Why make this a matter of allegiance to Christianity? Why not just take what is useful in any tradition? You just mentioned Nietzsche, right? So you found some of his work useful. There's no tradition of allegiance to Nietzsche. You don't, you, you don't have to worry about whether or not you are sufficiently Nietzschean in order to use his wisdom. You just take from him insofar as it's useful. Why not do the same thing with Christianity? Why, why waste any time wondering whether or not you are a Christian or telling people that you are or not? Why not get out of the religion business 
and use everything that is useful in human culture, however it comes to you, in a way that's non-denominational. Well, if that could be achieved, that would be absolutely wonderful. You're holding to one side certain, arguably, fiction writers and philosophers as being something other than fiction writers and philosophers and treating certain texts as something other than mere products of the human mind. And you have a lot of company, right? This is what every religious person does. But why not treat Jesus the same way you would treat Socrates? Well, that's a, that's a good start. I think that Socrates and Jesus had an awful lot in common. But the thing about Socrates is that he's primarily a historical figure. Whereas Christ may have been a historical figure, I think that the simplest assumption is that someone of, of that description existed, but he's also a mythological character, and the, the mythology is unbelievably deep. And what it is, in some sense, is, it, is the human imagination's attempt to construct a representation of the perfect man. And so Christ is the perfect man. Now, you may say, well, we don't know what that means. You can say that Jesus was the perfect man. Hold it, hold it, Sam. I didn't say that. Okay. I didn't say that. I said that Christ is the perfect man. That it's different, because I'm speaking at the mythological level, is that whatever human beings can imagine as perfect, in, in terms of the manner in which an individual could conduct himself, mm. that's what Christ represents. I'm not claiming for a moment that that manifested itself in history. That's a different claim, and we can talk about that claim too, but... I would say it didn't even manifest itself in the Bible. If you were going to write a story about the perfect man, a fiction of the perfect man, you wouldn't write it the way the New Testament is written, and you would get Jesus to do things that he didn't do and, and not do things that he did do, and he would say things that he didn't say. You can get a lot more perfect than what you see in in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, okay, so let, let, me, let me tell you why, briefly, why that story is archetypally perfect. Hmm. Okay, so, so here's the reason. It's because, as has been agreed upon by the sages of the ages, let's say, the fundamental reality of life is suffering and, and finitude. And you can layer on top of that, from an existential perspective, malevolence and injustice. And that's the lot of human beings. And so here's an archetypal story. The most perfect, innocent, sinless person possible is betrayed by his friends, his countrymen, and the foreigners simultaneously for no crime whatsoever in the most torturous possible way and also abandoned by the creator of being himself. And he accepts that all voluntarily. You see, the reason it's an archetypal story is because you can't get beyond that. You see, it, it hits a limit. It's, it's the limit of tragedy. And so that's where the perfection lies. Now, the issue is, well, what does that mean? And here's what it means. We can go incrementally here because I don't even buy that it's the limit of tragedy. I mean, first of all, the thing is anchored to a belief in human sacrifice. This is what is so weird about Christianity, from my point of view, is that this is not a religion that disavows human sacrifice. This is a religion that claims that human sacrifice is real and important, but there was only one that was, in fact, necessary and effective, and that is the sacrifice of Jesus. Well, that's the Protestant and the Catholic interpretation. It's not so clear with the Orthodox Christians. They don't really, they buy the, a version of Christianity that's more, that stresses more each individual's moral obligation to do the same thing. I don't know enough about Orthodox belief to dispute that, but most Western Christians have unacknowledged at the core of their belief system this assertion of the validity of human sacrifice, right, which is insanity. Well, it, it isn't insanity, Sam, if you think about sacrifice in the way that we talked about it earlier. That's not the way it's thought about even in the Bible. He had to die for our sins, right? He is the scapegoat. 
he is the only effective scapegoat, and he's a hero. He's perfect in your terms because he took this on voluntarily. I mean, to go back to what you were just yes. saying, this is not well, the ultimate tragedy because he did take it on voluntarily. It's more tragic if someone really gets screwed by the cosmos. Oh, yes, you're right about that. But the, the part, the fact that he took it on voluntarily is actually the part of this story that involves the transcendence of the tragedy. Because this, the, the story there, and this is a very old story, it's far older than Christianity. The story is that the best way to, to transcend the, the bitterness of life is to accept it completely, mm. including, including betrayal at the hands of your friends, including betrayal at the hands of your countrymen and, and the foreigners, to, to allow that to be acceptable, to take it on voluntarily and not to be bitter about it like Cain. Because you uh -huh. get murderous when you're bitter. The scientific attitude of speaking honestly about facts keeps smashing into religion uniquely. It doesn't smash into fiction. It doesn't smash into Dostoevsky. It smashes into Jesus, right? Because of what most people are doing with Jesus. Yes, well, okay. So, right, look, no arguments there. These are, these are very complicated things. They're not, they're, they're fiction in a sense, but I would think about them more as metafiction. They're they're what happens when you distill fiction into what's ever centrally true about fiction. And it's really, really true. And so when you're talking about becoming your best self or becoming more and more like the best selves that have ever existed, or you talk about transcending the self itself as an illusion, right? All of this stuff is worth thinking about and paying attention to. And there is a there there. I'm not doubting that for a second. What I'm insisting upon, however, is that we need never step off the razor's edge of real honesty and conceptual integrity, even for a moment, in order to walk in that direction. And that's, as you said, most New Agers see no problem in indulging any kind of happy talk about the significance of crystals or whatever it is they're connected to. And that's where it becomes startlingly unscientific. And that's where someone like Deepak Chopra and I can't agree about how to talk about things, because the moment we start, he hits me with, you know, you close your eyes and you feel at one with the universe. That proves that you preceded the Big Bang. Your consciousness was there before the Big Bang. Now, of course, it proves nothing of the kind. That's where he becomes a pseudoscientist. And so what I'm arguing for is that we just remain attentive to honest talk about what we know about reality, even while we have deep experiences and seek them out by whatever means. And again, I will grant you that there are means that would amount to a kind of internal costume party where you can think in terms of myth. If you said to me, Sam, I want you to think of the rest of your day in terms of the hero archetype. What are you doing today to slay the dragon and bring back that hoarded wealth to your community? That's a pattern of thought that I have no question could have some utility, right? Well, that's what we were doing today, Sam. Right. But again, the crucial bit is that in doing that, I'm not making claims to knowledge about the ethereal existence of archetypes. There's no, you know, Akashic record or collective unconscious. I'm not making claims of that kind at all in order to find this way of thinking useful. And I'm not aligning myself with any provincial tradition of myth-making, i.e. a religion, and claiming that my religion is better than others, which is you know, as we see every time we open the newspaper, a divisive game that we have to figure out some way of unraveling. Right, we do. And, and I mean, your emphasis on clear-headed thinking, I mean, this is part of the reason why I wanted to talk to you. I mean, certainly one of the things that you demonstrated the first time we talked was your capacity for clear-headed thinking. I mean, you're, you're crazily incisive and laser-focused. And, you know, those are extraordinarily useful attributes. And that's partly why I thought it would be so useful for us to have a conversation. I'm an advocate of critical thinking. We have to get this right. But having said that, the abandonment of all value structures, which is, say, the postmodernist perspective, isn't a way forward because it leads to it leads to a situation where people are going to be unconsciously possessed by far more foolish ideas than they left behind them. You're certainly not getting that in me. I'm not advocating that we abandon value structures. To the contrary, the value that we should have in hand, perhaps before any other, is the one you referenced earlier, which is honesty. 
on yes. every level because it's the only thing when you're talking about honest speech, it's the only thing that, that allows us to course correct collectively. It's the only thing. Yes, exactly. If you're going to lie to me, then you are denying me your view of reality. And insofar as you have a view that can be useful to me, we're now playing a game that is not at all optimized for course correction. And so as a, as a society, we need to be, and this is where your defense of free speech comes in and has been so useful, we have to be committed to defending free speech, however impolitic or unpopular or even wrong, because defending that is the only barrier to, in the limit, violence. Because the only way we can influence one another, short of physical violence, is through speech, through communicating ideas. And the moment you say certain ideas can't be communicated, you create a circumstance where people have no alternative but to go hands on you. But again, I'm not, there's nothing in me that is echoing a postmodern relinquishment of a sense that there are right and wrong answers. To the contrary. No, I, understand, I understand that. And I'm certainly not assuming that you are in that camp or that you think that way. It's quite clear to me that you don't. 